Hello, and welcome to Banking and Transform, the number one podcast in retail banking. I'm your host, Jim Roos, owner and CEO of the Digital Banking Report and co-publisher of the financial brand. Providing trust through personal financial education is an imperative for the entire financial services sector. It is also the cornerstone to building engagement across the entire customer journey. The need for financial education extends across every social and economic segment and every age category. Advanced technologies have made the delivery of personal financial education both more feasible and more impactful for any size financial institution. We have Ryan Swift, Vice President of Strategic Partnerships at EverFi on the Banking Transform podcast. Ryan discusses the value of financial education and how it is helping financial institutions making an impact in their communities and with their customers. Research done on behalf of EverFi dug into the emerging cultural landscape of personal financial education in the U.S. The research discussed the importance of financial education today and identified relevant opportunities and messaging narratives that deliver tools to customers more effectively. So welcome to the show, Ryan. You know, before we start, could you provide us a little background into who you are and a little bit about EverFi? Sure. Thanks so much, Jim. Uh, it's great to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Ryan Swift, and I, I've been at EverFi for about 13 years now or actually 12 and a half years, I guess it is. I can't remember exactly, but, and I head up our strategic partnerships initiative. And over the last, you know, 10, 12 years, I've worked closely with, um, you know, our, our team to build out a network of more than 800 financial institutions who trust us to um, power their financial education initiatives, both with customers, colleagues, and community partners alike. So we're, we're working on their behalf in schools, uh, working with their customers directly, and supporting any of their um, community-based efforts with nonprofits and community partners as well. Um, so we've been lucky to, to work with so many folks that um, believe in financial education and understand how important it is to bring it to the masses. Um, currently, I, I head up Strategic Partnerships, which is um, kind of come, it, it covers a few different things. I work with our, our, our clients directly in supporting their um, partnerships and thinking about how to innovate and how they can um, think, think, think differently about how they're bringing their solution to market. Um, as well as working with a lot of, a lot of um, state and national organizations that play in this same space with us. So um, Financial Health Network, you mentioned earlier, our partnership with the financial brand, among others, um, as well as like state banking associations and credit union leagues that, that really find it's important to bring this technology to the communities that their members care about. And so I've been lucky to be here for, for a while. And you know, at EverFi, that's been our mission to bring financial education at scale to communities um, across the country. Um, and we do it through unique public-private partnerships um, so that the public sector doesn't have to worry about paying a dime for our technology uh, because the private sector has stepped up to, um, to make sure that it's it's brought to everyone who, who can benefit from it. You know, Ryan, during the pandemic, you know, the government really stimulated the economy as we're all feeling right now. And in some cases, made it so the financial health of Americans actually got a little bit better. But many of these were just temporary fixes, uh, artificially stimulated, and there's still unequal access based on demographic segments to financial wellness. What are we, in your opinion today, from a standpoint of financial wellness and financial health? Man, that's a good question, <laughs> Jim. Um, you know, you're right. I think um, coming off the pandemic, there were, you know, there was government stimulus that that provided short term help, but not really a long term solution to some of the systemic inequities that exist here. And, you know, the truth is, if, if, if we're talking about financial education in this country, um, it's really nowhere near where it needs to be. Um, when we launched EverFi 14 years ago, there were only two states that required a personal finance one credit course for high school kids in order to graduate. Um, so while we've made progress today after Florida and Georgia are the most recent states to um, require this, now we're up to 13 states. So that's about 25% or so of states across the country that are requiring a one credit course to graduate. Now, if you think about that in context versus math and reading and other skills, um, it's really not a lot. 
Um, is it better than nothing? Absolutely. Um, however, what, what, really mean, what, what it really means is that three quarters of the states in this country do not require financial education in order to graduate. Now, of the vast majority of those, Jim, they do offer financial education or, you know, their, their legislature will say, hey, we need to teach our kids this content, uh, but we don't have any funding for it. And so that becomes an unfunded mandate across too many states here. And ultimately, uh, we've got teachers on the, on the ground floor who are asked to teach personal finance who aren't really super comfortable with the content. You know, and we hear this all the time across our network. We have 25,000 public schools now who leverage our technology. And many of the teachers are so grateful to have access to it because they're just not fully prepared. And what does that mean? It means you have a social studies teacher who's been there for 22 years teaching social studies who suddenly is asked by the superintendent to teach kids in high school about mortgages and their credit score. Some of these teachers might be comfortable with it, but the vast majority are thinking, wow, I don't really know where to start here. So, you know, we've got these unfunded mandates, um, teachers that aren't quite ready to do it. And ultimately we're, we're sending kids off, young people off to the real world, college, the military, or even the working world, just unprepared to make important financial decisions. And this is, you know, this has been exacerbated really, Jim, when you think about, um, you know, the rapidly changing financial services sector. So when we launched EverFi 14 years ago, the idea to bring technology or to use technology to bring financial, um, personal financial concepts to life for young people was, was groundbreaking. Nobody had done that before. And so, but now today with, how technology has completely disrupted the financial services sector. And you've got things today like crypto technology and Bitcoin that kids are asking about, they don't really understand. Um, banks and credit unions are kind of scrambling to try to figure that out and how to better um, serve their customers and members. You've got buy now, pay later, pay later, and all these other services that are out there that are changing the landscape of financial services, not even to mention some of the fintechs that are engaged in um, pursuing young people, especially around alternative banking um, programs. So I, I think the, the need for financial education has never been greater, um, but we still have a lot of work to do. I think there, we're seeing progress um, across several states, but it's, it's just not enough right now. So I never meet someone who says, oh gosh, I wish I, I didn't learn about um, taxes or mortgages, or most of them are saying, gosh, I wish we learned more about this. I never had this in high school. And so it's clear that young folks need it. Um, and as a society, we need to be better about providing it in the educational setting, and even for adults in different settings as well. So EverFi, does, does EverFi work with financial institutions so that they partner with educational organizations? Or is there also a component of EverFi that provides financial education that can be delivered directly from a financial institution to a consumer? Yeah, you know, it's actually both there, Jim. So when we launched the business 14 years ago, our big idea was to use technology to provide scalable, meaningful education for high school students around personal financial concepts. That was groundbreaking. Nobody had done it. Nobody had brought software into a school from the outside before. Um, so that's where we started was with high school students. Um, if we fast forward to today, and I'll skip a lot of the gory details, but we have, we have software that is provided for now 25,000 plus public schools across this country for elementary students, middle school students, high school students. And then we've even gone beyond, Jim. We have content for college students that can be consumed. And as you mentioned, direct to consumer through a bank's or a credit union site that can, they can license our software and offer it to their customers or members. Um, but on the high school or the K to 12 level, Jim, it's a turnkey program from EverFi, meaning we build the software, but we also have about a hundred former educators on our staff full-time employees of EverFi who live and work all across the country. And locally, they're able to work with superintendents, principals, curriculum instructors to help them understand how to best take advantage of our software. Because if it doesn't map to state standards, if it isn't engaging for a student to use and make a teacher's job a little bit easier, 
they're not going to use it. And so we've got to make sure that we provide the support for educators so they can put it in front of the students when and where they need it um, and make it really easy for our financial services partners. We have about 800 across the country who license our software and they trust EverFi to provide this technology to schools and communities they care about. Um, because banks and credit unions are asked to do more with less now, you know, they're, they're constantly, I'll talk with folks who work at a community credit union or a community bank and they say, well, I'm, I'm the marketer, but I also do our community programs. And I also train the tellers, you know, I also do this. Um, they just don't have the time to get out to all the schools that they might want to. And in the old days, previous to EverFi, I guess, not, not even that long ago, 15, 20 years ago, that was all we were doing. But now we're bringing scale and measurement into financial education programs that allows our partners to understand the impact of their investment and the return of what they're doing when they license our software in communities they care about. So is the need for financial education just for the younger demographic segments or maybe the underbanked or financially stressed? Or is financial education today really something that goes across all social economic groups? Uh, I mean, I, put simply, I think it's 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 needed everywhere. I think you can. It's easy to say, oh well, this community or these types of folks need it more than others. And you know, I wouldn't. I don't think we would ever argue on that point. I think there's um, systemic inequities that exist within our education system and within our financial sector over time that have made it really difficult for folks in certain communities, um, you know, to to be able to realize sort of the American dream, right? Like that, that everyone wants to. Like, I've never met anybody, Jim, that says, oh, I don't want to feel more financially secure or I'm fine, you know, I'm good where I'm at. You know, I don't want to feel better. Um, but the reality is, Jim, that, you know, the pandemic especially has exacerbated some of those issues and, you know, the income and wealth gaps that exist in this country are widening. So the, the distance between the haves and the have nots, it's not getting, it's closer there it's getting further away and so it's 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 easy to say oh yeah we got to start with young people right that's important um and we believe that there's it's important to begin um gosh when kids are really young but ideally around the dinner table but um sadly that's not happening what what research shows us is that parents today are are more comfortable talking to their kids about sex or alcohol and drugs and they are about money you know and and that's that's um, a problem right and so um our schools are are not quite where they need to be and so we're I, we believe that the public se sector can be supported by private sector investment i mean that that's been our model from the beginning but so it's obvious that young people you know need to be educated on concepts and and that doesn't mean first and second graders are learning about credit scores and mortgages or how to fill out a tax form um, but it's it's clear that young people um, are very curious, they're inquisitive, and they're able to handle basic concepts around um, personal finance and money. And so at our at our younger age, we're, we're, we're focused on uh, basic concepts around understanding what money is, um, where does it come from, like how does a family get the money they have through jobs and work, what careers are there, the difference between wants and needs and saving, et cetera. So there, there, there's plenty of research that shows, yes, we can teach young people even kindergarten, first and second graders about some basic concepts. And then as they go through, through elementary, middle and into high school, we can build upon their knowledge base so that when they do finish high school, they're better prepared or equipped to teach it. As far as, oh, does, you know, I, I when we first launched this gym, we had, you know, I remember sitting down with a community bank or a, a CEO in Virginia who said, well, you know, some of my some of where we have our branches, um, you know, it's really, you know, they're middle class and they're, these are some of the wealthy communities. So those kids don't need it. And it's like, well, wait a second, they do. Yeah. Um, just because a kid grows up in a family that has money doesn't mean that they're going to have the behaviors or knowledge base they need to also make good decisions. And so um, does everybody need it equally? Probably not, but it's clear that um, there is, a benefit to personal financial education for folks across the spectrum, regardless of zip code, um, and regardless of what their parents' education level is or what their parents' income level is. I think all kids, all young people need to learn about core concepts around planning, around saving, spending or budgeting, and even borrowing and developing the right habits. Um, so we believe in starting them young, um, but obviously, 
you know, there's plenty of folks uh, across the country that could benefit from some basic um, financial education in different formats. And so we're, we're out there trying to trying to fill some of those gaps. So you've been doing this for years. everfi has been doing it for years. You're not a newbie in the marketplace. This is really a community effort that financial institutions can connect with the educational organizations around their markets. And you mentioned earlier that you've worked with organizations on the return on investment, on measuring the results. What is the incentive for financial institutions to actually build a financial education platform that they can share out in the community? Well, you know, I, I think it's pretty, it's been great for us at EverFi, Jim, because when we first launched EverFi, um, you know, 14 years ago, we had to kind of convince folks that this was important. You know, I think back then, this is sort of pre-2008 recession or right on the heels of that. A lot of financial institutions were doing Teach Children to Save Day, spending an hour volunteering, and that was all they would do. They say, okay, that's good. We're getting out in our community. We're supporting our schools. And that was fine. But the reality is that since then, since 2008, when we launched this business, um, the game has changed. And, you know, community banks, community credit unions, and even large financial institutions, you know, table stakes are now required that they, they have some sort of resource. They have to provide different resources for them. Now, what's the incentive for them? I think it's pretty clear, Jim. The research shows that when you've got an educated consumer uh, on or a financially literate educated consumer, they're more likely to carry higher balances within that organization, you know, with, with, with your institution. They're more likely to engage in multiple products, right? And so banks and credit unions are always talking about increasing wallet share. They wanna, they wanna support their customers. They wanna support their members and make sure that they're there for them. And so you've got to have, you know, an educated customer is, is simply put good for the, the uh, financial institution's bottom line, right? And, you know, so that's important. I, I think financial institutions have opened up their eyes to that and recognize that this is important for them. So overall, Ryan, you know, when you, when you structure a financial education platform, obviously there's all different levels of what we have to learn about and it's changing every day because the, the marketplace is changing. What areas of financial education have you found to be maybe the most in demand, the most needed, the most accessed? Is it in the credit area more than the, the trip, typical deposit area? Do, do edu especially when you're getting into the, the older demographic groups of students, is it really the ability to get credit and evaluate financial systems? What is the most important area of financial education? Yeah, that's a great question, Jim. I think when, when we look at our data um, across our network of 800 partners who license our software and then deploy it to their customers and their communities, um, what we see is it's not all that surprising, right? So when we're talking about our adult consumer platform, the most popular content that we're seeing is probably what you would think it is. It's, you know, it's folks... Um, who are engaging with our platform usually two or three times a year. And so we love financial education. We wish that everybody was coming to our content every day, like it's a social media platform, right. but that's just not the case. So folks are prompted to engage with our learning platform a couple of times a year, normally because of uh, a major life decision. So they're getting married, they're having a kid, they're buying a home, they're buying a car, they're, they get a statement from their, uh, their 401k provider or from their, uh, from their credit unit about their, um, you know, their savings account or whatever it might be. But oftentimes it's when people need, need, have decisions in front of them that it's when they need to engage with content and look for a refresher or looking for um, some help around making these decisions. So what does that mean, really? It's about it's around the mortgage and home buying process that's very popular across our network. How to uh, build and improve a credit score that that we see that one playing across demographics to different age groups, etc. Um, saving for and planning for retirement, um, emergency savings is a huge topic today. Um, so you know we, we're seeing some core basic concepts around credit budgeting, savings, borrowing, a lot of the basic ones that all families and all individuals need as they go through their own financial journey. Um, and that's, those, are, those are sort of the most popular ones with our adult consumer platform. Going downstream, Jim, into the K-12 space, 
I mean, the teachers require these kids to take all of the modules typically, but when we go into the classroom with one of our partners, a bank or a credit union, and we lead them in an engaging activity to build upon what they've learned, the kids are incredible. They want to talk about investing. They want to talk about entrepreneurship. They want to understand their credit score better. Um, and they always talk about what we refer to as a trickle up effect. So I'll hear kids say to me almost every time I'm in a classroom with one of our partners that, hey, I know my mom's not doing this or my dad or my grandma is not doesn't know about this. So I need to go home and I talk to my mom about this. So um, we think that's incredible. Um, but the kids are really into investing. They ask a lot of questions now about crypto or Bitcoin or blockchain technology and how that is changing. The, we were in a classroom and they said, hey, should I invest my money in the stock market or should we invest it into, into Bitcoin or other, other of these you know, NFTs and other things that the young, younger generation is into? And so I think we hear a lot around entrepreneurship, young people wanting to start their own business, work for themselves asking questions around how to build good credit and then how to invest properly. I think these kids want to build wealth. These kids want to engage in, in markets and they want to be financially secure. Again, nobody doesn't, nobody doesn't want to feel secure, but I think too many young people today are living in homes where they're not secure. They're, you know, parents are living paycheck to paycheck. They're one false move away from, you know, having real financial troubles. And I think most of the young people we see throughout our K-12 network want to build upon that and don't want to experience these same difficulties. So you, you talk about the K-12 network. So I'm going to give you an example that let, let's say I have a, a, a child in high school. They come home and they start talking to me about things that I would put in the category of the new math where I really don't understand what they're talking about because they're talking about things that you just brought up, NFTs, crypto, things of this nature. And I don't want to feel stupid. So my financial institution has made a partnership with my high, my son's or daughter's high school. They have made partnerships with the elementary school. How does a, an adult, a parent, get access to the information that my child is being taught in a way that's that's built for from EverFi? Now, that's a great question. And, and our most successful partnerships, Jim, are sort of what you described. We'll have folks that say, hey, listen, we want to um, provide meaningful education for the local high school students in our communities. We think that's super important. We want to get them before they go off to the real world and have to make these decisions. We want to help them be ready to be good citizens and good participants in the local economies and ultimately good customers, right? Um, but the best, excuse me, our best partners will not only do a K-12 program, but they'll provide consumer education to their own customers, their colleagues, and their community partners as well. And what does that look like? Um, well, today, Jim, I mean, as you probably know, most consumers have a very high bar for how they're, um, you know, how they're how they're consuming content, whether it's news or sports highlights or communicating with friends and family via social media. But the reality is, is that we're doing everything on our our mobile phones, you know. I'm turning 50 next year and I can remember a time before I had my, my smartphone. But the truth is that consumers today, they want content that is um, always on or just in time, meaning it's there when they need it. It's digital or mobile first so that it can be in their pocket. And you know, when, when, when they get a, a statement from their 401k provider, they can just go, oh yeah, I gotta go back oh yeah, my bank has some stuff about this or my credit union provides this. Let me go check that out again. Uh, but they want personalized content, Jim. And I remember the first time I had a conversation with my wife about a, a, a pair of shoes, a pair of sneakers that one of the young colleagues of mine in the office had a few years back. And then the next time I scrolled my Facebook, there was an ad just for that brand right yeah. there. And it, whoa, it kind of blew me away, right? right? Um, and it was a little scary at first, but now I think we're we're comfortable with having um, advertising and marketing that's curated for me. That is that is personalized for my experiences. And I think financial education is no different. And so I think it's important that when a financial institution licenses our software, that they work with us to help personalize it and serve up content that's just right for their learners. And we do that in a few different ways. It's mobile first and digital, so it's always there. The most popular time for adults to engage our network, after eight o'clock at night, where their young kids have gone to bed. 
you could be sitting on the couch and then boom, that's when they, that's when they get onto our content. Um, and you know, so it's got to be engaging, relevant, timely, just in time and personalized. So you really have built, created, built content across all age categories well right. before a consumer gets into the banking industry in the traditional yeah. sense in your your kindergarten through 12 the uh k to 12 but then you have ways for these people to access it themselves if they're a student but also for their parents and other people customers to access it through the right. platform so you really you really take care of the consumer all across the entire life cycle that they have don't you Absolutely. And, you know, it has, we used to say K to gray, you know, we've got, yeah. you know, young people all the way up because, you know, I think about my, my own parents who are now um, in, in their early eighties and, and my dad is retired and my mom retired a while ago, but you know, they're, they're going through estate planning issues and they're thinking about, you know, how to handle um, 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 physical and health crises that come up because of the costs associated with this. So they have so much saved up just for potential health issues that might come up and all of these different things. And so the reality is that um, folks of all ages are gonna be tasked with um, making important financial decisions throughout their life cycle, right? And so, you know, we want folks to feel comfortable as they do that, we want them to be prepared. And, you know, our content, Jim, is, is sort of bite-sized for an adult, an, an adult consumer because of how we've been conditioned to have short attention spans through social media over the last 10 years or so. Yeah. So our content's usually two to five minutes in length and it's nice and easy. And it's not gonna make anybody an expert, but our, our goal is that we're, we're laying a foundation and we're helping folks feel more comfortable going to a financial professional and then engaging in a meaningful dialogue around what they need. Because everyone has unique financial um, goals and desires and um, issues that are coming up. And so we, every time, all across our network, the banks and credit say, well, we're ready. We want to help them, but we just, we don't always know what they need when they need it. And we believe that this educational platform can also provide real data for our partners who license yeah. it and provide it for their customers to have some insights into, you know, what, what Jim needs at different points in his life, because they'll know what content you've engaged with and then can have good conversations with you about it. You, you used a great word there, what they engage with. You know, on yeah. the podcast, we've talked quite a bit lately about the importance of moving from the transactional mindset of banking into yeah. the engagement mindset, actually getting people to come to the site on their own to search out education, ways of understanding financial services better, but also just to have that engagement because that's how you're going to get loyalty. You know, and organizations, you know, educating consumers about banking doesn't seem all that hard. I mean, in a way, it, it feels like, okay, I, I could educate a, a, a high school person around how they should manage their finance and all this, but you've been doing it for over a decade. And when organizations come to you, they've made the decision to most likely buy versus build. What, how, what organizations look at when they look at that buy versus build decision? And I know from my own perspective on, on what I've talked about third party providers for quite some time now, is that if you want speed and scale, you've got to work with somebody that specializes in this. But, but what do you see when you're out there in the marketplace, you're talking to financial institutions, what decisions they go through in that build versus buy decision? Well, it's a tough one, right? I mean, it's not an easy decision because over the last 10 to 15 years, especially uh, banks, credit unions, and large financial services firms have, have made significant investments into technology, right? To better support their own clients or customers and to make the experience easier and more engaging. So on some levels, I think um, what we hear often, Jim, is that, well, if I'm talking to uh, a bank or a credit union, they'll say, well, you know, there's, there's some folks that think we might be able to build a platform ourselves. Um, and they're probably right. They could build something. Yep. I think what they're not prepared for, or what we see more often than not, is the need to maintain and update a software platform like this. So um, building it out, like you said, it's not that hard. Like the concepts are not that difficult. There's plenty of um, sort of blueprints to follow around how to build an engaging software platform. The challenge is how do you update it? How do you maintain it for changing regulations, changing legislation, um, changing products and services, things like crypto and um, buy now, pay later, and all of these different subjects that are popping up over the last yeah. several years. 
I think most most financial services firms are not prepared to maintain and upkeep uh, a piece of software like this, and or even create it. I mean, you, you mentioned about what you look at at as the length of time and all these other elements. You know, I often, uh, Leah, my producer, often uh, we talk about the fact that you know I call the GPS of financial services. Why do you want to make the mistakes that Everfi made eight years ago <laughs> if you can avoid them? And why not take advantage of the winning strategies that have been put in place by the last 10 clients you signed on that even surprised you and said, boy, you know, we want to implement this across our system. So it really is, it's the GPS of financial education where an organization like Everfi can really help organizations get it, get it done right, avoid the pitfalls, take advantage of the opportunities, and, and most importantly, make an impact on their bottom line and on their loyalty of their customers. I, I think you nailed it right there, Jim. And I, I love how you described it as the GPS of financial education. Um, but one point I just want to echo and dig a little deeper on is around like best practices. And you know, over the last 12 years, we've built a network of now 800 plus partners. So these are yeah. banks, credit unions, financial services firms of all shapes and sizes. We have some of the biggest global financial firms who license our software and deploy it in multiple languages in different countries. But here in the U.S., We've got small community credit unions and community banks. We have mid-sized financial institutions, what we would call kind of mid-regional banks that you know might support a couple of states and 12 counties. And over time, Jim, we've really aggregated what we call just best practices, right? And so all the great ideas that we share across our network don't always come from Everfi. You know, I, we can't yeah. take credit for them, but we have some really creative, innovative partners on the, across the table from us who, who care about providing good experiences for their customers or for their members and are thinking um, innovatively about how can we engage folks on educational concepts at the right times. And so what we've done is aggregate this into what we call a partner marketing center. And all of our partners who will have a dedicated account manager who helps them kind of navigate, well, how do we use this? What audiences do we want to engage? What topics are important to the people that we care about? Because what works for a big bank in New York might not work for a small credit union in Arkansas. Now, some of those things might overlap, but we can share best practices around how most of our partners will think about using education as a vehicle to engage their clients on the types of products or services that they need to push towards greater or increased financial health. And a lot of folks are just sort of navigating their own personal financial journey, like by the seat of their pants. You know, like most folks are just kind of doing their best and winging it. Um, and what we find is with thoughtful intervention on behalf of our clients, they can engage folks in a meaningful way and help them down that journey with the products and services they need at the right time. And that's what our, I think that's what customers, they want, and that's what they require. That's, they don't want, um, you know, big bank just kind of pitching them this product or that product without using, without understanding who I am and what I need at different times throughout my own journey. And so we've been lucky you know, 800 partners, we've got, we have 800 marketing teams and 800, you know, member service teams, and they all do some really cool things. And so we're able to say, so if you're a client of mine, Jim, and you work at a mid-regional bank and say, listen, we want to engage um, our mid-size employers in the, in, the, in the area, all of these businesses, and we want to provide financial wellness for their employees. I can say, Jim, I've got some great suggestions for you. Um, over the last couple of years, we've got some great partners who have done just that. Let me share a couple of things, and then you tell me what you think is best for your audience, because you know them better than I do. And, and that works really well. So when you think about the build versus buy, it's not just EverFi, but it's our network of 800 partners and the power and thought partners that we have there that help all of our newest clients as well. It's interesting. You know, I've worked with EverFi on webinars with a financial brand for it's going on three years now. And it's interesting in that a lot of times your company brings in clients to, to help with the webinars and to, to have the discussion with us. And they're always so passionate about what they're doing in the marketplace, in the community, in creating educational platforms for the community. What is also interesting is that every one of them doesn't look like this simply as an altruistic type mission. 
It's a financial mission. They can tell you what they're making, how much they've, you know, what the ROI on the platform is. And in many cases, they have one, two, as many as three people assigned to continue making this program more and more effective. And I think you said it really well when you said, you know, it's amazing what your clients can bring to the table that can help them do it better and do it differently than you would have even thought of. And then they're excited when other organizations deploy it because it, these aren't companies that are in competition with them. They're actually sharing ideas that they're really passionate about as well. You know, for these organizations, and I, you've already mentioned that all sized organizations work with Everify, but if I was to be a, let's say I'm a financial institution, I bring you in and I love what you're talking about. How long does it take from me saying, let's go forward to being able to implement some platform of education with Everify? Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a good question. And, and what we found is that, um, you know, it sometimes depends on the size of the institution. Um, I, I'll, I'll say that the smaller the institution, oftentimes they're a little more nimble and oh, we can kind of- No doubt about that, yeah. And going, going earlier. But generally speaking, if you've got, if you've secured the right buy-in on your level from the top levels and they're ready to make a commitment to this, um, from that point on, once we have an agreement in place, it's usually going to be anywhere from um, probably two to six months to get a site live from a um, consumer perspective. So we're talking about supporting your customers or your members. Um, do we have something? So that's really the content, the content on the website, then. Yeah. So yeah. an adult consumer side. Okay. On the on the K to twelve side, we've got an established network of. Um, 30,000 or 25,000 or so public schools who use our technology. So generally speaking, if, if you say, hey, I want to sponsor the 10 schools in my footprint here, the 10 high schools, um, we can we can get those up and running pretty quickly uh, because we have established relationships yep. over the last 12 years. Um, on the adult consumer side, then we're once you say, yes, we want to do this, then what we do is set up a plan together. We'll go through a timeline together and a plan. Typically, two to six months is, is is fair. We've done several that can be two to three weeks uh, with smaller institutions that can just move quickly and they want to get a site up and they don't have a lot of feedback for us. Um, the larger the institution, sometimes there'll be, you know, we have compliance reviews and uh, legal reviews yep. and all of these different things. So we're very used to that. We're accustomed to that. Um, but sometimes that will slow down. Yep. Um, the time necessary between you saying, okay, we've got the thumbs up, we're ready to go forward, to the site is actually live, in market, it's linked into your website and available to all of your customers, your colleagues, and your community partners. But I'd say probably two to three months is pretty typical there. And this can be compartmentalized. I mean, somebody doesn't have to deploy the entire platform at once, I don't believe. They can actually take no nope. parts of it. They can say, let's deal with the credit side of the organization and make it so that they can actually implement some of this faster. But you're right. We, we, we as bankers tend to get in our own way when it comes to speed of implementation. I, I know from working with you in the past, you know, you, you can go as fast as somebody wants. You know, they're going to want to personalize some of the information and all that. But the reality is the slowness is usually not on your shoulders as much as it is on a financial institution because of the, the normalcy of the day, the compliance, as you said, the compliance, the legal side. Because I remember being a salesperson often saying, well, you know, we have 25 institutions that have said this is OK. Yeah. And the comment comes back always. Yeah, but we're different. Well, you know, yeah. at some yeah, point we have to make the decision. Like at some point we have to make the decision. What's the, you know, do I benefit more from getting it out in the marketplace quicker or do I benefit by having to go through all the hoops? So lastly, Ryan, I have two really quick questions from a standpoint sure. of financial wellness and financial education. Number one, what is the biggest challenge facing the financial institutions from a financial wellness and financial education perspective? And secondly, What's the greatest opportunity out there that you see? Oh, I love these questions. Um, so the biggest challenge for financial institutions, um, let me think, I, you know, it's, it's rare, Jim, that we're encountering an organization today in 2022 that doesn't see the value of providing financial wellness tools. It's almost like it's table stakes now. So I, th I think the challenge is, um, Finding the finding within an organization the 
the right landing spot for it and the right ownership of it who can navigate internally. Because yeah. oftentimes you know, an institution doesn't just want to say, hey, we want to give financial education to everybody. We want to be everything to everyone. Oftentimes, Jim, we'll start with a very strategic um, implementation where we say, hey, let's start with your, your own employees first, right? Let's put your money where your mouth is and let's test drive this with your employees. Then we'll roll it out to your customers. That way your employees can talk with them about this resource, share their, their own experiences with it. And then let's work strategically within your own you know, product marketing calendar and think about what are, what are you aligning with your customers over the next nine to 12 months and how can we layer in education as a solution there? Yeah. So I think um, the biggest challenge is probably navigating complex organizations and, and being able to work towards that vision and helping them understand that, hey, it's okay to start small yep. and then grow over time and build consensus with the right people. Yep. Um, we've done it great with so many great organizations and other times it's been difficult. You know, It's not always an easy implementation, um, but I think when you've got some buy-in and folks that are ready to do it, that's it. But navigating those complex systems and structures internally can sometimes um, make it a little more challenging to get this in front of the folks who can really yep. benefit from it. The opportunity, man, I think it's it's pretty clear. Um, I think consumers today have higher demands for their financial institutions. Um, that's very clear. They're looking at these neo banks, these fintechs, alternative solutions. I know Apple and Walmart and others have been kicking the tires around, hey, maybe we can enter this space. And they're probably not going to enter into it as a traditional bank because of too much regulations, but they're going to come at the financial services sector with competitive products. And so I think what it means, the opportunity here, Jim, for me is simple. It's it's how can you better engage your customers or your members? How do you build trust and loyalty with them through education and allow that to lead rather than products? So I think a lot of institutions are getting this now. They don't necessarily need to lead with products, but they need to lead with relationship, trust building and education. And those that do it and do it well are gonna be the ones that I think win. Um, you know, the shift to, with, to online banking and mobile banking has been incredibly disruptive. And I think the, insti the, the, the institutions that we deal with um, really need to figure out how to provide that awesome service. Because you said it earlier, Jimmy, you said, oh, well, we're different. And we've always heard, well, what sets our bank apart or what sets our credit union apart? Yeah. Well, our service and our people. And, you know, well, how do you build a great relationship with a customer that you just don't see? Because I got to be honest, man, I haven't been to a bank in a long time that wasn't an EverFi customer that I wasn't visiting. You know, I can do everything on there. And that's great. But how do you deliver an incredible experience to your customer that engenders loyalty? And we believe, and the research shows it now, that um, education should be a part of that strategy. Not the end-all be-all, man, and we would never say that. But yeah. you know, when it's done thoughtfully and strategically and personalized to your consumers, using the data in a meaningful way, this can add significant value and build trust with your customer base. And, and I think that's, that's where, where folks can win today. Ryan, thank you very much for your time today. You know, it's it's extraordinarily important in the marketplace, but it, it, it's always good to talk to you and your team because you are making an impact. You have very passionate clients. I mean, it's it's, it's always a thrill to, to do a webinar, do an event with some of your, your clients because they're all, they all believe in what's going on, but they're also, you know, it, they're making an impact in the marketplace right now where a lot of people, and especially with, inflation and the cost of everything going up the way it is are feeling very insecure about their finances. So again, Ryan, thanks so much for being on the show today. Jim, it was my pleasure. I appreciate your time and, and we, we love the partnership and working with you and, and um, hopefully folks will find this helpful and informative. So thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform, the winner of three international awards for podcast excellence. If you enjoy what we're doing, please take 30 to 45 seconds to give some love in the form of a review. It really helps us continue this great platform. Finally, be sure to catch my recent articles on the financial brand and the research we're doing for the Digital Bank Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to my producer, Leah Longbreak, audio engineer, Sean Rowe Hoffman, and video producer, Will Pritz. 
I'm your host, Jim Roos. Until next time, remember, financial wellness should not be a luxury for the few, but a basic and standard requirement for everyone.